Time now for the Sunday talk. As we've heard, the Fort McMurray fire continues to rage, now threatening Saskatchewan. It's wildfire season and not just in the West. Tonight, a special panel of experts here to explain the science of wildfires, what might be coming, why the threat is changing, and what might be done. Because we've seen forest fires threaten cities before and scientists say it will happen again. 2003. Kelowna, British Columbia, 239 homes destroyed. There are some people that um, didn't come back and rebuild. It was just too much for them. 2011, Slave Lake, Alberta. We are evacuating. 433 homes burned to the ground. And what used to be a building that I frequented when I was four years old uh, is no longer there. And now, Fort McMurray. Basically, it's raining ash and you know your, your eyes are burning you know it's time to to pack up and leave a fire at least four times the size of slave lake at least 1600 homes reduced to ash and it's not just alberta in danger now our infrastructure for forest fighting is fully uh, uh, in use now in the northeast bc is monitoring seven major wildfires that are threatening public safety and according to the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre, as of Friday, 1,244 fires were burning across the country. The number is not really unusual, but the level of destruction is. Can't just sort of cross our fingers and hope it won't be a bad year anymore. Increasingly, every year is worse than the one before. I'm joined by our panelists. Paul Kovacs is director of the Institute of Catastrophic Loss Reduction. He's in Toronto. Johanna Wagstaff is a meteorologist with CBC News. She's in Vancouver. And Mike Flanagan is professor of the wildland fire at the University of Alberta. He joins us from Edmonton. Obviously, the firefighters have done an outstanding job here. It's, it's remarkable that 80,000 people have been removed from, from danger. But this fire, not the first of its kind, Mike, and, and probably almost certainly not the last. No, Wendy. Large fires are a common feature in Canadian forests. In fact, on average year, we burn 2 million hectares, and that's about half the size of Nova Scotia. So there's a lot of fire on the landscape. And these fires are often large, and only 3% of the fires grow to be, you know, the size of 200 football fields, but they're responsible for 97% of area burn. So relatively a few fires are responsible for all the impact. Now this fire is particularly bad. It's particularly extreme. It generated its own thunderstorm called a pyrocumulonimbus. And then there was lightning from this fire generated thunderstorm, which started even more fires. But the thing about this fire is the impact because it started so close to town. If this fire had started 100 kilometers to the east in the boreal forest of Saskatchewan with not many valleys around, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. So, Paul, why has this added to that? Why has this been so destructive? Uh, it's because the fire got into town. As Mike points out, there's been many fires. There will be many fires again in the future. But it is rare for the fire to get out of control when it's near a large community. This is the largest uh, fire evacuation we've ever had in Canadian history. This appears to be the largest loss of property because uh, this fire happened to get out of control right next to a large community in the middle of the forest. And many, many buildings are destroyed. A lot of people have had their lives disrupted. How did weather contribute to this? We, we've been hearing about heat and wind. Johanna, you know. Well, it has been a, a record winter and spring for the prairies as far, as far as how dry and how hot it's been. A third driest and second hottest spring ever on record uh, for the prairies. The past four months have just been so ripe for explosive fire conditions. And then we had this big high-pressure ridge move in across Alberta uh, late April. And that's what led to the explosive fire conditions. And in fire forecasting, uh, we talk about the 30-30-30 rule. If temperatures get above 30 degrees, winds over 30 kilometers per hour, and relative humidity under 30 percent that's when fires can start uh, quickly and spread very quickly and we've basically been seeing these three factors almost consistently uh, for the past week or more Wendy and Mike we, we've heard the boreal forest around Fort McMurray referred to as almost a tinderbox how much of the rest of the country is like that well there's fire problems in northeastern BC and along the Manitoba Ontario border but I'd like to pick up where Joanna left off and that is 
for fire to occur in the boreal, we need three ingredients. First, the fuels, the stuff that burns, the dead leaves and needles on the forest floor, the shrubs, the trees themselves carry the fire. So that's the first ingredient. Second, you need ignition in Fort McMurray. Uh, it's under investigation, but given the time of the year and the location, it's probably a human-caused fire. Third, you need the weather, like Joanna was talking about. Hot, dry, windy, we call it. 30, 30, 30. And that's exactly what we had in Fort McMurray. So we had explosive conditions. In fact, I'm hearing from the line that aspen trees were exploding. And aspen is usually not very flammable. It's the conifers we need to worry about. But it's like when you light a barbecue and it does ignite right away, and then all of a sudden it catches, it goes woof. And that's exactly what happened in some of these forests that don't normally burn so explosively. It's because there was superheated gas and then they caught fire all at once and exploded. Paula, are there other communities that you would be watching at this point? I mean, how many other Fort McMurray's could there be? I don't want to scare the pants off of people, but we have a huge forest and we have more northern communities. How, how big a threat is this? Every community in the north is at threat. Um, there are important differences that take place for the individual, for the community and for the province in terms of preparedness. There are things that can be done to be as ready as possible, even though the fires, these large fires, can grow out of control. Um, there's a small community in northern Alberta called Swan Hills. Swan Hills passed a law saying everybody in the community must have a roof that's fire resilient. Every building, sorry, every building in the community and every building, every property in the community has to have a zone of protection around it. There are things that can be done at the community like Swan Hills and others have done. And if had have been more of that in, in uh, Fort McMurray and Slave Lake and Kelowna, maybe losses would have been less. But every community across the north is at risk when you have these uh, very unusual and very dangerous conditions. Johanna, back to weather issues. The, no particular fire could be linked directly to climate change, but, but how much of that is in consideration here? Well, uh, it is interesting. As, as I mentioned, it has been a record uh, spring and winter for uh, how dry and warm it's been. And we're just coming out of a record strong El Nino and the past patterns for explosive wildfire seasons after a big El Nino, which typically means warm and dry for Western Canada. We do see uh, a rise in the intensity and the, and the frequency of forest fires. But this was a record El Nino and a warming climate certainly contributing to how these weather patterns changed all over the globe. So uh, one of the the big uh, takeaways from most climate models as you move it forward in time with a, a warming uh, climate, places that are hot and dry are going to continue to get hotter and drier and wildfires was one of the biggest concerns when it comes to a warming climate. So unfortunately this is a concern moving forward. So Mike, not just one hot dry summer. Absolutely. Um, we found that the warmer it gets the more fire we, we see. In fact, in Canada, our area burn has doubled since the early 70s, and we attribute that to human-caused climate change. I get asked all the time, why is temperature so important? And I'm talking about fire across the uh, size of a province, not an individual fire like the Fort McMurray fire. And there's three reasons. One is the warmer we get, the longer the fire season. Alberta's fire season started officially March 1st this year, one month earlier than usual, because our fire seasons are starting early. Second, the warmer it is, the more lightning we get. The more lightning we get, we get more fires. Third, the warmer it gets, the more evaporation we get, evapotranspiration. This means that the atmosphere is more efficient at sucking the moisture out of the fuel, and this is really critical. Unless there's more precipitation in the future, and the models suggest that there's not, our fuels will be drier, it'll be easier for fires to start and spread. So, Paul, they're, they're talking about there's no real estimate yet because they haven't even gone back into Fort McMurray to sort of count the losses, figure it all out. But they're talking about $9 billion. If these fires continue, if they start to become more common, how on earth does Canadian society pay for this? How do you, how, and first of all, how do you even figure out what the cost is? Um, there's not enough evidence yet to put a, a clear number on it. You have, to get, you have to wait for the burning to stop and go into the community and count. But um, there is a, a technique of looking at each home and working out the cost of replacing it. Uh, that will be done over the next few weeks and we will know for each home, each business, uh, each school, each hospital what the damage is and how much it will cost to repair. There's enough evidence already to know that this will be more costly than the largest event we've ever had in Canada, which was the flooding in southern Alberta in 2013. This is definitely the most costly wildfire by several factors. 
And um, when we do get a chance to add up the numbers over the next few weeks, this will add up to a lot. But um, most of fire damage in Canada is covered by private insurance. Uh, the vast majority of the homes and businesses in um, Fort McMurray, uh, we will likely find out, have insurance. The insurance industry has this kind of money. This is what the business is for. They've uh, lined up the funds in advance. Uh, finding the funds to pay several billions of dollars is what insurance is about. And they will be there ready to do their job when uh, the, we have time to get in and look at the damage. I've got to wrap up in a minute or so, but I want to get a sense from each one of you what you're going to be watching for. Johanna, we'll start with you. What, what's next? What are you going to watch for? Well, for obviously the Fort McMurray fire, weather is still a huge factor. And what we need is days on end of rain, which we're just not getting in the forecast. And that's what most firefighters have said, that they need the soaking rain. That's the only thing that'll uh, sort of stop it. It could end up burning for weeks, if not months on end. That sometimes is the trend with larger fires. However, a big cool down coming uh, Monday could uh, help to slow that rate. But uh, winds have been everything. Every time they shift, the fire shifts. So I'll be keeping my eye on those winds. What are you watching for, Mike? Well, you know, more now than ever, we're seeing people live, work, and play in the boreal forest. And fire is part of this boreal forest, so we see this intersection between fire and people. And sometimes it's devastating, like it's what's happening in Fort McMurray. So I see this as a game changer in the way we do fire management in Canada. So stay tuned, there, there will be changes. What kind of change do you expect? Well, I think fuel treatment, the Fire Smart program, which BC, Alberta, and other provinces spend millions on already, will be spending a lot more on treating the fuels around communities. Last quick point to you, Paul, what you're watching for? Um, it's incredibly challenging to show up after an event and spend billions of dollars to repair and rebuild. And I think there'll be a greater national focus, as Mike says, on trying to reduce the risk of wildfire, but to broaden this and look at other hazards like flood and earthquakes and other perils in Canada. How can we put greater attention uh, up front to reduce the risk, uh, invest in prevention so that we don't have these losses in the future? Well, I'm sure we'll all be watching the, uh, the progress of, uh, of the fire over the next few days. Thank you so much for being part of this tonight. Thank you. My Thanks. pleasure. Thanks.